Wonderful. Hi, everybody. Welcome to our public talk today, The Great Shift, People-Centered Emergency Management to Improve Community Resilience. We have uh, great speakers today. We have Dan Neely, who is Manager of Community Resilience and Recovery with the Wellington Region Emergency Management Office, and Ty Wagner uh, with Youth Council. Uh, coordinator of the Office of Sustainability and Resilience, and of course, Marcus Donaldson, Community Resilience Coordinator with the Office of Sustainability and Resilience, both with the city of Tempe. So they will be moderating our session today. So uh, we want to welcome a Dan Lee back, who joined us in 2019 for a public talk on the whole community, emergency preparedness and response, kicking off a discussion series. Uh, that connected emergency management and sustainability policies, practices, and actions, and explored how cities can integrate emergency management and sustainability practices to foster current strengths and examine opportunities to bring holistic resilience to our communities. Um, my name is Ann Richmond. I am director of ASU Sustainable Cities Network and Project Cities Program. And we have the good fortune uh, over the past few years uh, to participate in a series of panel discussions, uh, including the Climate Action and Resilience Planning in Arizona and People-Centered Climate Action and Resilience Planning across the U.S. And these were really aimed to build uh, hazard mitigation plans in collaboration with communities uh, to address extreme heat. So today, Dan Neely uh, is going to join us again serving as Global Ideas Leader for the project Neighborhood Justice, Cool Kids and Cool Futures, Cool Places, which is a collaborative project between the city of Tempe and Arizona State University and funded through the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation. Um, the Sustainable Cities Network is one of the partners in the project. And so we appreciate the opportunity to really work with these wonderful organizations, bring speakers in like Dan uh, to help share best practices and hopefully, um, yeah, give us great tips on what we can be doing in our communities. Um, addressing extreme heat uh, in the previous project that I mentioned aims to organize and support and promote youth climate action, uh, building strong and trusting relationships with indigenous communities advancing more effective forms of community city university partnerships. And today's uh, session will be facilitated uh, through Ty Wagoner, who I mentioned before is the Youth Council Coordinator for the city of Tempe and also for this project, and her colleague, Marcus Donaldson, the Community Resilience Coordinator of the project, uh, both reside at the city. So um, Ty, if you'd like to take a moment to introduce yourself, you are an alumni of the School of Sustainability and a current graduate school of ASU's uh, School of City, uh, Geographical Sciences and Urban Planning. Uh, that would be great. And then, of course, we'll turn it over to Marcus uh, as well. So I just want to say hello. Thank you, everyone, for being here today. Again, my name is Ty, like tie your shoes. Um, I'm a Youth Council Coordinator with the City of Tempe and graduate student in the School of Geographical Sciences and Urban Planning. I also have a certificate in environmental education, very passionate about child-centered community development, and very excited to be uh, presenting to all of you today. Thank you for being here. Um, hi, everyone. As uh, Anne mentioned, my name is Marcus Donaldson. Uh, I'm a recent graduate of the Justice Studies program at ASU and a future PhD candidate. Um, my work primarily focuses on racial trauma and police violence on social media. Um, however, I've recently joined the city um, in September of last year. Um, and prior to doing so, I, I did work in uh, the education field as a teacher with a specialty in racial equi equity and uh, anti-racist curriculum implementation. So I uh, thank you for being here today. It is a great turnout especially as Katia mentioned earlier before people joined with only five days of kind of like sharing this so thank you for being here and Dan thank you as well for being here um, and with that we can uh, introduce our uh, project that we've been working on uh, which is uh, the cool kids project It's formerly known as cool kids cool futures cool places 
uh, the young people uh, on the project actually refer to it as neighborhood justice, uh, which is a youth led program designed to combat extreme heat and climate change. The, the project uh, emphasizes community building, power sharing and youth agency to guide uh, regional policy and decision making. And with that, Ty is going to share just a quick 30 second promo video. So thank you, Marcus, for the introduction. Neighborhood justice is the term that young people coined in Tempe to describe this work. Um, it is a, it's the result of conversations that we had with young people. We hosted a focus group over the summer at a camp in Tempe where teens told us what climate justice meant to them, what kind of materials would be engaging and exciting for them to join this work. And ultimately, that is the video that we were able to come up with through those conversations, which will be airing at McClintock High School and Tempe High School next. Um, throughout the last couple of months, we've been really strong on recruitment. So we recruited already 75 students into the program using campus tabling events, focus groups like I just described. We also have done some climate action days here in the city where young people could come together, plant, meet city people, and also just have a really high profile example of what native landscape can be in Tempe. We also hosted a really fun Dune screening at Harkins, where the young people learned about biomimicry and found examples throughout the film. That was a great way for young people to be back together after really hard times during the pandemic. So that was really fun. And then we've also been working on community outreach, hosting tables at uh, the Envision Hub to get young people excited about what emergency management could look like and how we can merge uh, opportunities to find jobs within the city, but also really critical heat relief during our summers. And finally, we hosted our last climate action day at McClintock on campus to increase shade and shrubs on campus. 25 young people came out on a Saturday morning <laughs> to do this work and worked really hard on our tough soil in Arizona. So we're so grateful for them and so excited for what our project can and do region and uh, carry this environmental stewardship in young people for the rest of their lives. The uh, thank you, Ty. Uh, thank you, Ty. Sorry. Um, and so today, obviously, we're joined by Dan Neely, uh, who is a global ideas leader on the Neighborhood Justice Corkage Project uh, and is the manager of the Community Resilience and Recovery at the Wellington Region Emergency Management Office in New Zealand. Uh, Dan is an Arizona native and an ASU alum from 1998. Uh, Dan has worked around the world in disaster recovery, starting as a Peace Corps volunteer in Honduras after Hurricane Mitch, and later for the International Organization of Migration in Sri Lanka after the Boxing Day tsunami. He and his team apply a community development perspective to emergency management, seeing every person as part of the solution in preparedness, response, and recovery. And Ty is briefly gonna go over the agenda, as you can see here, and we will pass it to Dan as soon as she finishes with that. So thank you again, everyone, for being here today. We're going to start off with our presentation from Dan. Then Marcus and I will open the floor for questions and answers from our team. And uh, Anne will close us out around 110. So I'll also put this in the chat. It, for me, it's helpful to see it visually. But uh, if you need to reference back to this, please do. And I'm going to pass it over to Dan. Good, everybody. My name is Daniel Neely. I am the manager of Community Resilience. And thanks for the introduction, Marcus and Ty. Um, it's great to be with everybody. I'm an Arizona native, um, and I have been living in New Zealand for about 15 years. And uh, you might notice on my screen as well, it says Daniel Neely, she, her. I'm actually uh, identify as he, him. I'm using my wife's computer while here in New Zealand. Um, bit of a juggle trying to make things work. Um, so I'm going to just share my screen here and can everybody see that? Fantastic. Great. Um, so presentation is really around community empowerment or uh, how I learned to stop worrying and love spontaneous volunteers. It's uh, 
a bit of a, a, a joke on an old movie, um, some of you might be familiar with, but it is it does speak to the heart of, of um, I think, our relationship with community and emergency management. And with that, um, I really kind of asked myself the question, what does an emergency management do as far as preparation for this uh, presentation? It's really a question I've been asking myself for about 10 years. Um, coming from a community development background into this field, I've often wondered what is exactly my role and my perspective here. And so I did, uh, and I kind of did what a lot of people do is I Google searched that, what does emergency manager do? And this image came up um, and it really spoke to me. And I'm just going to run you through this little meme um, because it says, you know, what do, what do my friends think I do? Run around in hazmat suits all day, maybe. Um, what my mom thinks I do, which is, you know, we all hope our mom and dad think of us as superheroes. Um, what my boss thinks I do, sit around talking on radios in my shorts. Um, what the world thinks I do, I don't, I don't quite know what to make of this picture, but I don't think it has a positive connotation regardless. Uh, what I think I do, you know, hero complex, maybe shooting asteroids out of the sky. But what we actually do is uh, often, you know, surrounded by paperwork and emails, et cetera. And I'm sure all of us can relate to that. And if you actually can Google what does an emergency manager do, and this meme came up, I think it really speaks in a lot of ways to what emergency management um, is perceived as, how we might see ourselves, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but what it, what it doesn't do is actually speak to what really happens in an emergency. And that is basically um, things like the community really stands up and participates. And these are examples from New Zealand of the Christchurch earthquake. Um, it was a big earthquake that happened in 2011, destroyed the third biggest city in our country um, in many respects. Um, but we have people coming out of the woodwork to help out. This is a bunch of um, university students that came to help um, move silt that had been moved around. In the Nelson fires in 2019, um, we set up an emergency evacuation center from the official point of view, but the community set up their own. And we had about five or six people going through the official one and literally five to six, 700 people a day going through the community driven one. And people were coming out in droves to assist. Um, in the 2020 pandemic, um, Iwi and Modi, which are the indigenous people of New Zealand, um, really set up their own logistics networks and were looking after their own people within uh, days of getting the event happening. Whereas the official response, we took a good week and a half to really get our, our machinery. So it really highlights that, you know, in many respects, communities were doing things better and faster than we were. But that's not just in New Zealand, that's around the world, right? So um, in any of these pictures, these are all community driven responses, Mexico earthquake, Cyclone Debbie in Australia in 2017, the Nepal earthquake, Hurricane Harvey, the, you know, the famed Cajun Navy. Um, these are all examples of communities coming out of the woodwork to look after each other. Nobody having really any sort of quote unquote official training. It's just people doing what they knew, know how to do and looking after each other. And so the question we've been asking ourselves the last 10 years in New Zealand, especially after the Christchurch earthquake is, how are we quote unquote enabling, empowering and supporting community resilience when quote unquote, this is what emergency measures do, right? And so I really like that imagery on the right because it really does highlight like, a, it kind of puts a perspective on what emergency management and emergency manager is as opposed to um, the people from the community are also emergency managers in pretty much every aspect of the word. And so I think the change that we've been trying to apply is really bringing more of a community development practice to our work. And these are some examples, as you can see, of um, community development practitioners acting as facilitators, acting as networkers, acting as enablers of other people's ideas to make those ideas a reality. And I think that's a, that's a growth area for our sector, at least in New Zealand, around um, how do we also bring the community to the table in every aspect from mitigation, response, recovery, um, alongside of that official planning that we do. Um, and this is some of the wording that I just wanted to share that's actually been put into our latest New Zealand uh, budget. But, it, it, but this wording that we need to ensure that our emergency management systems are geared towards an inclusive community-led response. And so this is part of the change that's happening in New Zealand. But I think that wording is really on point where we need to be going. And it's something that we've been advocating for um, for a while in Wellington. So really, I guess the point for us is if we want to ensure that our emergency management systems are geared towards that community-led response, we really need to become better community practitioners. I'll share a quick example from uh, my own life, a uh, story of failure, which is uh, always the best learning experience. Um, as, as Marcus pointed out earlier, I was a Peace Corps volunteer 
and arrived in Honduras, which is in the bottom left-hand corner, um, right after Hurricane Mitch had blown through the country. And at the time, it was the third biggest hurricane ever recorded, um, took the lives of 20,000 people, um, displaced nearly a million, and destroyed approximately 75% of the roading network. So it was a really powerful event, um, caused a lot of destruction. And like a lot of young, enthusiastic Peace Corps volunteers, I arrived in country, and I wanted to do some, some good right away. And the advice I was given by the Peace Corps volunteers that were leaving was, invest in building relationships with, relationships with people before you start trying to do any projects. Um, and like a lot of probably enthusiastic people, I kind of heard that, um, got some of that community development training at the outset, and then dived right into doing some work. And I identified this problem, which is, you know, tr a lot of trash is taken outside of the city. This is kind of, a, unfortunately, a common scene um, right outside of the village, and it's often dumped on onto a hillside or into a stream. And I thought to myself, That's, this is a problem that I can help solve, right? A lot of hubris there as a young person, um, really probably without that, you know, kind of... Uh, taking the time to understand what was going on. I said, I'm gonna, I'm gonna solve this problem. And the, I think the intent was good, but uh, I started identifying the problem and identified a solution, which is trash cans, right? Um, I got some funding, I helped build these trash cans, I painted these trash cans, I helped identify a place to install them. And what uh, ended up happening was once the project was in place, I was really surprised that nobody's really using those trash cans. And I took this picture of a dog taking a poop right next to the trash cans. I thought it was a really good metaphor at the time um, because I realized that um, the project was a total failure. Even though I'd gotten those trash cans installed and built, I kind of had this epiphany afterwards that it was actually me, the one that was doing everything, right? So I had identified the problem. I had identified the solution. I did, I project managed it. I got them in, um, but, but it was me that had done all that. And there I was trying to support the community but I was, I was the one driving and more to the point, I actually never went to the community and even asked like, do you see this as a problem? At which point at that stage, um, most of the, nobody in my village really did see that as a problem. And so that was a really big learning lesson for me about the importance of how we engage matters more than anything. And that's, that's probably the, if you take anything out of this presentation today, it's how we engage matters um, more than what we do from my experience. And this is a, this is a picture of one of those trash cans. Uh, when I left, they, at least, you know, some of the wall, some of the trash was getting put into the trash cans and being burned, um, which was a step in the right direction, but they, you know, never really utilized as I had envisioned it. So there's a great presentation, which I'm not going to go over today, which I really encourage everybody to go online and watch, which is Jim Deere's seven principles of asset-based community development. It's pretty much has almost everything you need to know about community empowerment in eight minutes or less. Um, it's a, he's, he does some really fantastic work. And I think this is again, the growth area for emergency management is how do we incorporate these types of methodologies? And one of those um, is the yes and concept from improv comedy. So one of the things that I've done with my team over the years um, is we've, we've tried to build these types of methodologies into our work. Um, improv comedy, I think is a really good one, which if it's emergency management, you think, why would we go do improv comedy training? Um, but pretty much every emergency is an improvisation of some sort of planning that was done beforehand. And learning the skills to roll with the flow is a, is a, is a great technique. Um, it's also really important when you're doing community development. Um, but listening techniques, which is something that we all can probably benefit from. <clears throat> Tikanga and Teteriti, which is um, Modi cultural um, knowledge that I think our sector needs to improve upon, um, as well as design thinking, appreciative inquiry, storytelling, because we're moved by stories, not by data, um, behavioral psychology and, and co-design principles. These are all things that as emergency managers, we've really tried to upskill ourselves so that how we engage can get us better outcomes in the end. So there's how methodologies employed during readiness inform actually what and shape what we do in response and, and lots of examples that I just touched on that really reinforce that. Um, so one way that I think over the years we've started to look at our relationship with the community and the official systems goes a little bit something like this. On, on one side, we have our official emergency management structures, which is the you know really nice tight structures that we're comfortable with. Um, it's the stuff that fits in a circle that we can quote unquote command and control, which is the type of language we use in emergency management. Um, and historically, at least in New Zealand, I think we looked at spontaneous volunteers as something that is messy and something that 
you know, needs to be managed, quote unquote. Again, there's a lot of guidance on how to manage spontaneous volunteers. And we've always struggled with that. I think after the Christchurch earthquake and the last several big events we've had in New Zealand, we've actually seen that capacity and capability that's in our communities is actually far exceeds what we have in the emergency management system. And in many respects, um, in pretty much every event I've, I've been in, I've seen the community school, the official emergency management when it's a large event. Um, but there's still a bit of a disconnect there, right? And it's uncomfortable for us because it's, it's kind of like a messy plate of spaghetti where there's no clear entry point or no clear accountability. And what we're trying to do over the last decade or so is really bring these two interdependent, ind currently independent systems and make them more interdependent, right? Um, because they are independent, they do rely on each other. And the way that we've gone about that, um, one of the ways anyway, is through our community emergency hub system. And I'm just gonna talk a little bit about that. A community emergency hub, as the sign says, is a place for communities to gather and help each other during an emergency. And it's basically what we see from the evidence base, which is really clear, is that after an event, people tip in in a huge way um, to help each other. And people that want help often kind of have a hard time initially connecting with the people that need that help. And so a community emergency hub is a identified location within a suburb that people can um, go to after a large event. Um, and a, as a way of visualizing that, um, it's basically a system that we're trying to, a, to a system approach that we're applying that better enables and supports that community led response. So on the far side is, you know, what we know is people will inevitably, first thing they do is check on their families, their loved ones, um, then they kind of start checking on their neighbors. Oftentimes in a large event, um, people start pouring out into the street and it's often the first times they might meet their neighbors. Um, but if they need help or they can offer that assistance to somebody else, what we're really promoting is go down to your local community emergency hub. Um, each of our hubs then is connected uh, to our EOC via radio and now increasingly um, some internet systems. And then each of our EOCs are connected to kind of like a, what would be in the United States, like a county model maybe. Um, but importantly, each of the hubs are not part of the official emergency management system. So we work as facilitators with our communities to help the, our communities set these up. Um, we have a little hub kit, which I'll show you in a second, um, but it's not part of the official system. So we can't stand up one of these hubs. It's entirely driven by the community. And so this is a map of Wellington, uh, part of Wellington, Lower North Island. Um, and we have 128 hubs across the Wellington region and for context, we have about a little over half a million people that live in the region. Um, we have eight cities and basically one kind of county government. And what my team does is we spend time working with communities um, to do some community planning to be able to activate these hubs. Because the, the risks that we have in, in Wellington are probably you know, quite different than in Arizona. We have earthquakes, storms, tsunami, some of those big imminent risks. And so um, this is the planning that goes toward that. But each one of these hubs has individual planning done at a suburb level um, that you can do. And sometimes we do those individually and sometimes we do those as groupings when they're kind of close by. Each of those hub planning sessions is really treated as a party. I'm a big believer that um, we, we need to take as much doom and gloom out of emergency management and the way that we communicate that with our community um, and make it more about people coming together to support each other under times of stress. Um, and we always have food and we always make it an opportunity for neighbors to meet neighbors. That is central to what we do um, from a social capital point of view, because again, the evidence is really clear that it's not uh, what's in your emergency kit, it's, it's who's in your emergency kit that really matters. So each one of these planning sessions are treated as a party. And when we do this, we can do this over any one or maybe two sessions. The very first thing we do is we ask people, you know, why, why, why are you here today? Um, and what, what really matters. And sometimes people, especially in the early days, would put their hands up and say, oh, I'm not here to talk about that. I'm here to talk about response, right? But we just, you know, we say, stick with us for a little bit and play this out. Um, why, does this, why does this matter for you? And we create a word cloud right in front of them. And it always, you can always see the penny drop, like, oh, this is the why, right? We're always trying to help our communities answer the why. This is why we're here, not to do response, but to protect our community and the amenities and the, and the family and the people and the environment that we love. So we do, this is the very first thing we do, and we kind of helps ground the conversation for the future. Um, we then go into a process of, we ask people, what are the resources and the vulnerabilities in your suburb? And we pull out big giant maps 
with lots of uh, little yellow and red stickies, as you can see there. And people are asked to um, identify the resources from a groups and networks, places and spaces, services and businesses and infrastructure. And you see the ideas just start churning, right? People get really excited and they often enter those conversations thinking that there actually isn't much in their community. Um, but by the end of this, they've, they've really identified, actually we have a whole lot of resources, but we also get them to think about it from a vulnerability point of view. All of that information is then captured um, by my team and it's aggregated. And so um, this is an example from one of those sessions um, and they, these are all, this is all unique to that community. These are all ideas unique to that community. You can see, you know, churches and uh, restoration groups, et cetera, et cetera. And again, we do the same thing from place and spaces. Um, so they'll identify maybe a school where young children might be or a rest home, for example. Once they've done that asset mapping, then we ask them, how would you solve these five challenges without any official government support? And we frame that from the point of view, and we really emphasize when we say no government support, we don't mean, you know, after an earthquake, you cannot factor in police or fire or any sort of government assistance into your planning. How would you rescue, which is basically how would you just check up on everybody? How would you provide medical shelter, water and food using the assets that you just identified? And people start kind of brainstorming and they start riffing and they come up with a whole bunch of ideas. And we provide a basic general guidance on you know, how to make sure your water's clean. But then these are the ideas um, that they've identified of where they could get water. You can see, for example, Garage Project 6,000 liter water tank, that's a, that's a brewery that's located in that part of town, as well as different streams that are running through that uh, community. So these are just all ideas that um, can help people when they're improvising, which is what happens in a big event, um, when they're improvising, it's more of a framework for them to kind of launch off of and start developing plans on the fly, as opposed to trying to have a rigid plan to stick to. And each solution is unique to that community. So we've done 128 of these right across the region over the last eight years, just completed it last year. Um, and each one of these is unique to that, to that very suburb. Um, so all of that goes into chapter five of the um, community Emergency Hub, this one you can see in the upper left-hand corner is from Karori, which is one of our communities. Um, so that's part of what goes into this hub. But the other part is working as a team, especially when you have spontaneous volunteers. And I guess the point that we really try to emphasize is um, that people are capable problem solvers every day. And um, we've learned over the years, and I'm a big believer that um, we actually don't need to do a whole lot of specialized training for communities. If you go back to those early examples, um, in pretty much any event, people come out of the woodwork and start problem solving. And that's what an emergency event is, right? We have a flat tire on the way to work. That's a small scale emergency that we have to improvise and figure out a way um, to get to work. Big events are just bigger improv improvisational challenges. But what we did find through some of the evidence and through our own experiences is people need a little guidance um, to coordinate. And that really helps. If you can give them just a little guidance, they don't need that much of the training, but some little um, on-site guidance. And so we came up with this idea of putting job descriptions as little lanyards that people can reference. And so we've replicated the very basic elements of an EOC um, to coordinate and put that into the hub guide. And so this is just a basic job description for people um, to do a range of things that, you know, looking after each other, setting up a, setting up a um, reception desk or whatever the case may be. Importantly, we don't expect people to kind of read this stuff for the event. It's all been designed for use when people have never really engaged with it before. And so that's what goes inside of the hub kit. Those are some of the lanyards. You can see kind of information coordinations, needs and offers board, um, and that hub supervisor. But that's basically all that goes inside of a hub, inside of a community emergency hub. It's a big plastic box. It just has the basics to set up, set up, uh, set up a community emergency hub. And on the right, this, this is an example of what the hubs look like. Most of them, probably 80% of them are at schools. Um, probably another 10% are at community centers and another 10% are at faith-based um, facilities. And uh, it has a big sign and it advertises, this is a place where you can go after a large event. And that's something that we've been promoting. And we just did a survey and roughly a third of Wellingtonians know the purpose of a hub and um, where their local one is and that they have to activate it, not the emergency management system. We feel that's a pretty good, that's been a really big jump just in a few years. It was all theory up until 2019. Um, this model has actually been adopted elsewhere around the New Zealand now. And 
Um, in Southland in 2019, they had a massive flood. Um, think of some of the big floods that you've seen down in the South, for example, and 26 community emergency hubs were activated, led by more than 1,000 spontaneous volunteers. Um, you can see this is a screenshot from the news, and I like this one because the guy's wearing our hub lanyard. Um, he had never received any emergency management training and found himself as a community, normal community guy, uh, helping lead his community through that event. And I was actually ended up going down there to support that event. Um, so I got to see it play out firsthand. And it was incredibly uh, smooth. And what the real amazing thing about it is it led, it led us, um, there's a bit of trust, as you can imagine, um, letting the community do a range of things, but allowed us to then focus on the people that need our assistance most. And we really turned a lot of the response over to that community. And so that was a, that was a really amazing experience to see um, that concept operate at scale for the very first time. I'll just touch on a few other elements about it. Um, as you can see from this community, this is a member of my team. Um, and one of the some of the, some of the one of the imams from our one of our local mosques had participated in one of the planning sessions and approached us afterwards and said he wanted to make the mosque um, a community emergency hub because he really wanted to emphasize that um, after a, you know a large earthquake or a large emergency event the mosque is open to everybody and so um, we worked with them and made you know we've identified we made the mosque a, a community emergency hub. Um, but one of the other neat things about it is he also recognized a lot of people were curious of what goes on inside the mosque, and they also wanted to open the doors to allow people who were curious to be able to go in to the mosque for hub exercises. And so it's kind of provided a twofold element of helping them um, better establish themselves in their community, as well as having stronger relationships and partnerships with emergency management, as well as providing more capacity to the system after a large event. Um, so it's been, it's, it's been a program that's opened the doors in a whole bunch of unintended ways, which is really fantastic. Um, we do community emergency earthquake drills where we let the community activate these kind of things. And we, again, we turn it into a party. And I've always liked this picture because um, this is one was done right in Island Bay, which is right by the beach. And this we, we always had food. And this guy on the left who's wearing the hub supervisor, he rocked in barefoot right from the beach, um, participated, had some, you know, had had some food and, and he was one of the best, what we call a controller, um, which is the person that runs the event. He's one of the best hub supervisors and controllers I've ever seen. And, and uh, just really re reinforced the idea that you don't need quote unquote training to do this stuff because a lot of people have are capable human beings and, and uh, that really kind of was solidified in many ways, but this, I love that story. Um, community emergency hubs are promoted by the school. So I just got some screenshots. So they advertise themselves as schools but also as community mercy hubs. And the point that most all of our principals make is their communities, they're there for their community every day. And in times of stress, it's not gonna be any different. And also it's uh, been integrated as part of our program now um, right across the system. So Wellington Water, which is kind of our water agency um, is developing their community infrastructure resilience program, which is how we'll set up water to communities. And they're basing that right along the hubs so it's really the whole system now, the emergency management system is gearing itself to support what the community does in times of an earthquake or big stress event. So some of the next steps we're looking to do um, online um, reviews of our community emergency hubs. We're integrating these more with Iwi and Marai, which is the indigenous people from New Zealand, the Modi um, and, their, and their places. Um, we're looking at setting up Starlink, which will be able to give us internet access to the hubs and our communities um, if the entire grid goes down. We're bringing those hubs um, into our EOC planning and all of our big exercises now. So those become injects for emergency measures. And we're also partnering with the Red Cross where they're gonna be helping roll these out as well. So that's a very brief overview of the, of the concept. Maybe a couple of things that we've learned. Um, the hub concept really does provide a structure for communities to better self-organize and respond more effectively and more efficiently. It uh, creates a contact point for the official response to connect with and better support the community response, because now we know we can go into every suburb and that's the assumption that we, we can go and uh, that's a contact point for us. It produces higher, more diverse levels of pre-event engagement, and it really provides a consistent structured work plan program for emergency management staff. You know, with it's, it's a really clear piece of work for us to be able to do. I'm just going to touch and that's, you know, certainly if anybody's interested, we invite everybody to kind of continue going on this journey. We've been doing it now for, been working on this for almost 10 years um, and we still have a lot 
a lot of growth to, to go still. Um, two other points I was asked to just touch on um, the, the role of community. Um, we have a big tsunami risk, just like you would have seen in Japan in the 2011 tsunami. Um, and so we kind of put that idea, what would your community do um, to better raise awareness? And our communities came up with a really simple, elegant design of just painting tsunami lines across the road that says tsunami safe zone. Um, it was it was kind of a, a just a genius, simple idea that we would have never have come up with, but that's the power of kind of collective ideas from the community. And then one other one is our Modi engagement program. And this is a growth area for us as well, right across New Zealand um, and ways that we're really incorporating indigenous planning and culture into our work, five different ways. One, we're supporting the development of cultural competence and confidence for Remo staff. That's my organization, Wellington Region Emergency Management Office. Um, we're developing a framework to incorporate local iwi and Modi into regional emergency management governance. So um, iwi, which is kind of like a tribal leaders, are going to be sitting alongside of our mayors and city administrators in the planning. We're looking to develop guidance for iwi and Modi representation um, within our EOCs and our ECC, which is kind of a regional EOC, um, but basically making sure that we're bringing those leaders and liaisons right into the EOC with us as soon as an activation happens. So we're getting that cultural guidance right from the outset. We're working with uh, local Iwi and Modi to improve their level of preparedness for emergencies. So we're designing programs with them and we've been doing that for a little while, but um, we're designing programs with them um, and, and making sure that they're leading that as much as possible. And then we're working with Mirai, which is kind of a gathering place for Modi um, to identify the roles and responsibilities they might perform in response and recovery. And so one final point, it's just a big thanks to our community resilience and Remo team because it's not just me doing this. There's a whole group of people that have been um, kind of brainstorming this and innovating this for the last decade. And they certainly deserve a lot of that credit as well. And with that, thank you very much. I really appreciate uh, everybody's uh, time and really keen to have a conversation going forward. Thank you. Thank you, Dan. Um, I believe now we're going to move into our question and uh, answer uh, portion. Um, if you do have questions, please uh, submit them. We've been trying to compile these. So uh, if your question is not asked, please just you can resubmit it. Um, Ty, is there one that you would want to start with? Yeah, I can start. I'll start from uh, some of the recent ones in the chat. So we there's a question about reaching out to libraries as a potential community hub. Dan, what do you think of this idea? I think it's fantastic. I, I think any facility that serves a community purpose every day is generally the best facility for something like this, right? So the more multifunctional you can make it um, to the widest group of people, um, the more people are likely to use it um, and in a times of stress, right? And I think that's, that's one thing, you know, I always come back to is we, we all of us fall on what we know in times of stress. And so creating new emergency management structures and systems um, and expecting people to suddenly shift is, is almost a guaranteed recipe for failure. And so the more that we can leverage existing uh, assets and, and planning, the better. Yeah, I think that's a good segue into this other question too. So naturally meeting people where they're at and um, exploring different communities, you're bound to uh, confront some different opinions and priorities in these kind of spaces. So we have a question in the chat from Anne about what types of conflicts you might've experienced in these hub meetings and exercises and how you might've resolved them. Hmm. When, uh, a good question. When we first had this, uh, when we first started moving into this model, um, we had some difficult conversations because we had for years, uh, quote unquote, I should say quote unquote, but the, you know, emergency management volunteers. Um, and I think one of the challenges that we experienced in New Zealand is some of those volunteers saw themselves as kind of being in charge of the community without any sort of authority. And when we moved to this more decentralized model, um, some of our community members took umbrage to that and struggled with that idea that they weren't in charge anymore. They were never in charge that I think that was part of our culture had created that with the training that we were giving them. Um, we nowadays, I don't, you know, we don't have that issue so much because it's pretty widely accepted. It's probably the biggest one that jumps to mind. Um, thank you, Dan, and thank you for those questions. Um, 
I have another question here. Um, it's about the strategy in uh, determining the location of the hubs. Um, what, what, what was the strategy that went into that? And then also the, the second part of the question being, uh, what strategies have you found effective for building credibility with the youth in your community? Um, uh, in earlier conversations, you share with us that there's 128 community emergency hubs and 80% are in schools. Uh, can you speak a little more about the relationship you have with schools, students, teachers, principals, parents, and so on? Sure. Uh, so the first part of that question is, um, we have determined that, or our goal basically when setting up those hubs is, they should be no more, nobody should, on the balance, nobody should have to walk more than 30 minutes to get to a hub. Um, that we, didn't, we don't meet that black and white everywhere, but uh, on the balance, that's, that's the model. So um, every community, um, has one within, with, you know, has a hub within 30 minutes, basically. Um, with regards to, and, and that's farther distances in rural areas, I should point out um, quite, a, quite a bit. Um, with regards to youth, that's, an, that's, that's youth defined by around 16 to 22 is, is how we're currently defining youth. And that's been a growth area for us. We focused a lot on younger kids over the years um, but this is this is an area that we're working on right now, and one of the things that we're going to be doing, my team is just finalizing this. I'm looking forward to when I check it out when I get back to New Zealand, is um, taking the hub model into schools and highlighting some of the base, basically highlighting that young people are capable. Um, part of that storytelling of the of the student volunteer army out of Christchurch and doing a hub exercise without any real training and giving them some injects to be able to launch in. Um, and do something that's active, um, engaging, fun, but also highlight that they can, they are leaders in times of stress, right? They're absolutely provide leadership. And um, we're hoping that's, we've been kind of testing that out and gotten some decent feedback that that seems like an interesting model. So that's what we're planning. Uh, thank you, uh, Dan. I, I guess a, a, a relevant question here. Um, oh, I just saw another one. Um, Actually, continuing in that train of thought, Melissa has a question here. It says, have you encountered any situations where a few locations are appropriate within a 30 minute walk and then there is competition for citing the hub? If so, how is this handled? We have, we have encountered that. It's, it's interesting because um, with, as, as the concept has grown in popularity, we've had um, multiple facilities put their hands up on a few occasions and um, we're kind of just going with what has probably been there the longest, but we have changed a few. Um, when, we, when we started rolling this out, some had higher levels of flooding hazard to get to the facility or didn't have as good access for people with disabilities. Um, and so we have kind of weighed out the offerings, the, the benefits and the risks of each facility in a couple of occasions and looked at it from that point of view is what's ultimately what's best for the community. Thank you, Dan. I'm going to ask you another question now. Um, your answer about the building youth credibility, I think, was really interesting. And from our perspective, working on neighborhood justice, too, it's it's a challenge to challenge that adultism that we sometimes carry with us into spaces working with young people. And so there is another question here about building relationships and best practices for working with communities. How how does your staff build relationships and create that sustainable dynamic? For long lasting change. Yeah, cool. Um, so I think part of that is I've, I've, as it's my job as, as a leader to basically um, give them the, the space to build relationships, right? And so um, if we're going to meet people on their terms, and we got to meet with them on their terms, and sometimes that involves having conversations that aren't necessarily part of our agenda, right? Because we, you know, we're all kind of got an agenda to go out and so my team have done everything from, and they've just gone to, they're, they're, they're allowed, you know, a, a fair bit of space to just go and engage as they see fit. And I've had staff attend yoga workout sessions with community members, because that's where the movers and shakers are at. And they're doing that on my time, tend, doing yoga on my time. They're going to barbecues and parties. Um, but I think that's part of it is we, you know, we have a responsibility to create the space so they don't feel the pressure. So they so they feel that they've got the time to build the relationships with people on their on their terms. It's it's as simple as that. That's and awesome. Where, 
right? They've got to go and they've got to go to where they're at. I think that's, we can't expect people to come to us. We've got to go meet them on their hours, on, on their locations and on their, on their territory. Awesome. I, that's lovely. I have some ideas now for yoga with our, our teens in Tempe. Um, so that's it. It is a good segue into the conversation about COVID because we're talking about a lot of in-person engagement and how in the past we threw parties and did all these different things to keep people involved. Um, and there is a question in the chat about how strategies have been adapted during this really weird time with COVID and if you have any reflections on that. Yeah, um, it, a couple a couple of really good question, right? And um, I remember for for when COVID was happening, you know, so much, so so often we'd be pushing like, no, we got to let enable communities to come together, and then um, then this is an event where we don't want communities to come together and look after each other, right? So at the time, as COVID was scaling up in New Zealand, I'm sure it was here too. Um, Facebook groups were forming to be able to look after neighbors and and drop off food parcels, et cetera. And we were a little reticent about that at the time because we really wanted to keep people, you know, minimized. Um, but we were, in the end, of course, people are going to make good judgments on the balance. And I think that's what, you know, they were putting good safety protocols in place and they were looking after each other in appropriate ways for the, for that event. And it just kind of, that, that event really reinforced, yep, at the end of the day, people are good problem solvers and they're going to do the right thing on the balance. And we get too wound up about the potential risks, which are small, and we amplify those risks to be something bigger than they're not. And at the end of the day, as emergency managers, we've got to really trust communities to do the right thing. Um, thank you, Dan. I have a question here from uh, Danielle. who says, can you please discuss the role of localization slash localism within the context of this topic? I assume it's within the context of emergency management. Um, if if that is uh, uh, something that you can you can answer, sorry, I'll, <laughs> for the brain I'll ball. The answer is as I as I understand it. Um, I think at the end of the day, right? Like you know, we we really try to recognize communities of interest and communities of place. And so I think there's a localization. If I understand, I guess this is how I'm interpreting the question anyway. Um, and we recognize that um, people care about their communities of interest and communities of place. And so we really try to build that hub concept around um, who's around you. And we have a general concept of how that works, but we really have also recognized that you have to adapt um, your programs to those unique communities of interest and communities of place. And so um, anytime we're going to facilitate something with a community or deliver something, we almost always have to adapt it in, in some way. You know, it's kind of 80% standard, um, but we'll, we'll, always, we'll always bend it 20% to meet the needs of our communities from a preparedness point of view, as well as during response and recovery as well, right? Hope that kind of answers your question. You always got to uh, adapt. Thank you. Um, yeah, I mean, and if there is follow-up questions, please feel free to ask. Um, I do have a, another question about uh, how other city and county officials have uh, adopted the community-driven approach and if there were uh, opportunities and or challenges in rolling this out, because it is kind of something that is, is, is not, the, not the norm of a community-driven emergency response. Um, and so, yeah, that, that is the question that I have. Yeah, yeah, um, lots. I mean, we, I could, we spend hours talking about that. Um, it was a new concept. There was a lot of reticence at first. And um, I guess for clarification, it's not entirely community driven, right? And that's why I come back to that Venn diagram. You need, they're two interdependent systems. So the, the biggest shift has been when, you know, when I got in emergency management, I still see it time again. Event happens, we go, we set up the EOC, we go, we set up your NIMS functions, ICS, um, Instant Command Control, and um, we do some plans and we roll those plans out, right? We're trying to flip that with the hub model and say, we recognize communities are doing something right now. And in our planning process, in the intel gathering phase, we're really going to go out, um, we have a point to con uh, connect with our hubs in our, in our communities, and um, as well as other pathways, and how do we go in to support what they're already doing, as opposed to doing it to our communities and then kind of bending it afterwards, right? And I think that's the, the biggest shift 
and and that the, it was it still is uncomfortable for quite a number of people in emergency management, especially um, people that maybe have been really grown up in a system that that's that top down pure top down model is is how it's been. And I can't speak to how it works in the United States, but I can say that's how it works in New Zealand, right? Um, but we're now in all of our EOC trainings and everything else. Um, as you, you know, as I tried to kind of go in that last slide, the whole system now is, is really, it's taken us eight, 10 years, is really bending itself to going, we're gonna go out to support our community and we're gonna go with a higher trust model. I think that's one of the most important things to emphasize is it's a higher trust model that our communities are gonna do the right thing 90% of the time and we're gonna trust them to do it. And, we're, and, and then that allows us to focus on supporting those who need that support the most. Great, thank you, Dan. Um, I have another question. You, you spoke a little bit about accessibility earlier and we have a question related to that topic. So does your program provide any level of funding to the hubs to support their operation setup and make them fully accessible? And there's an example of the Americans with Disabilities Act. Maybe this, you know, there's probably similar legislation in New Zealand. Um, can you speak a little bit about accessibility and support? Yeah, so we, I think one of the, we were having this conversation a little bit earlier today. Um, the hub program comes with almost no funding, to be honest. Um, what's, I think that's one of the real strengths of the model is um, it's, it's leveraging what's already in a community, right? So those, most facilities have to meet those standards already. So um, we're, we're working with facilities that um, are, are already um, accessible. And then with the hub program, the only way we've ever really supported is kind of writing some um, support for grant funding, but we don't actually give money, nor do we strengthen buildings because the issue for us is largely around earthquake strengthening. And uh, that's one of the elements of why we built it not to strengthen a, a building, but as just a hub kit. So if the building is damaged or if that facility needs to go back into use again, like a school, then the community can move that um, to another, a different facility right down the road. That's really great. Thinking about community as, you know, caretaking, taking care of one another as part of uh, making accessible places and resilient places. Um, and then, so there is another question here, getting back to youth and outreach. So can you comment on the use of social media and engaging youth and its communication and using social media to communicate about hubs? Uh, yeah, we've got we've got a crazy bunch of weird comms people in our team who are amazing, and they do a lot of really weird, funny uh, stuff. And I think that you know they've they've recently pushed us into uh, a variety of TikTok and new kind of platforms um, that old guys like me don't use. And again, I. I I, I, for us, I think that I, I really trust them. They're, they're fantastic and they're irreverent and, and funny as, and uh, we've gotten some really good traction on social media. Check out Remo. I'm sure if you Google it, Remo on uh, Instagram and all those other places. Awesome. Will do. I have that uh, queued up now. Um, and then we have another question here from Blaine. Um, are there any local nonprofit volunteer management organizations involved in the hubs? orgs that are already involved in the volunteer coordination space? Uh, to an extent, yes. So we have Volunteer New Zealand and Volunteer Wellington. It's a volunteer agency right across New Zealand. Uh, they, we work with them as partners um, and they used to help us recruit official emergency management volunteers. But what we really encourage now is um, come along to one of our sessions, familiarize yourself with the concept, but actually go volunteer with an organization that's doing good work every day because that's where the social capital is being built. That's where strong communities are being built every day. It's actually, you know, it's all about strong communities every day, right? Um, and as long as people are familiar with the hub concept and come along to, you know, have, have join in one of our sessions, we're, we're really confident that they don't need to do much more than that. You know, um, I'd rather see people volunteer uh, for something else that is beneficial to the community every day, whether that's planting trees or looking after animals or looking after people. Thank you, Dan. Um, I have a question here from uh, Sarah. Uh, good to see you, that you're here, by the way. 
uh, how do you include the homeless community in all of this? Um, that's yep. the question. Another, another good question. Um, our city welfare teams, generally we have not included um, the homeless community in any sort of hub exercises. They've, you know, they offer, anybody's allowed to, you know, and open to participate. Um, we've not done active outreach to the homeless community. Our city community development teams have really strong networks with the NGOs that look after homeless. And um, in an event, it's very likely that uh, from what past experiences are, that we'd be setting up welfare centers um, to look after that, that population. Uh, thank you. And I have another question here about um, uh, more of the community, and then we can go on to some other types of questions to, to do with funding and marketing and such. Um, how has your community uh, hope conversations positively influenced community understanding? And has there been any breaking down of barriers pertaining to diversity, equity, and inclusion, uh, specifically with marginalized popula populations that you work with? Uh, populations that you work with, sorry. Um, ooh, complex. Can, can you repeat the first part again? Sorry. Yeah. How have your community hope conversations positively influenced community understanding? And then the second part of it, has there been any breaking down of barriers pertaining to diversity, equity, and inclusion, specifically with marginalized populations? Sure. Um, so I think in the first instance, neighbors coming to meet each other over food and positive um, con and constructive problem solving, which is what happens at, at these hub planning and then the exercises, we've, we've seen time and again, neighbors meeting each other and strengthening those relationships, right? I've, I've actually met somebody on my own street at one of these things that I went to in my own community. Um, so I know it happens and we get a lot of stories about that. That's qualitative. We don't have any... Um, quantitative kind of studies on that. Um, as far as breaking or more inclusion of different um, ethnic communities, um, the example that I just showed earlier, like the mosque becoming a hub is, is just one of many of those examples where um, I think bringing people together and letting and giving them, not giving them is the wrong word, but like encouraging them and enabling them to do what they're already doing well and coming together to meet each other and work together is a way toward breaking down those barriers right and i think that's what our what our, our work has has done in that space is um, we always try to throw a party there's food it's about working together under stress as opposed to you know death and disaster bang 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 um and We've seen time and again, like people from all, I mean, Wellington for perspective, one third of Wellingtonians are foreign born like me. Um, and so you have people from all over the world in Wellington. It's a very cosmopolitan little city. And, and, and we just see neighbors meeting each other from all walks of life at, at these events. And, it's, and if the picture I showed earlier, um, you might've seen it where it was, if you looked at that picture, there's a whole bunch of people from all over the world there. And I, I think that goes, um, it goes, it goes away to helping people meet each other and become part of their community. Thank you, Dan. I have another question here from Anne about other countries. So have any other countries um, taken a similar approach and resilience um, and modeling resilient hubs based off of your approach? And if so, do you find that they experience any um, similar challenges or successes? Uh, yeah, I've actually, we've had a, quite a number of cities from Australia, the United States, and Canada um, uh, look at implementing this. It's a, quite a number of versions of it are being rolled out in the 100 Resilient Cities program. So we were part of that uh, a while back, but we've had, yeah, cities from all, all those three other countries um, looking to do something similar. And it's a big question of how, how do we build our systems to better account for the, ev the clear evidence base which is people participate and contribute and people recognizing maybe that their current systems aren't fit for purpose. And um, so, yeah, I, I could, got, we've had conversations with quite a number. It's been, it's been pretty exciting. Awesome, that is exciting. Uh, and then we have another question here about funding. So uh, the, 
I'm not sure who asked this. I'm sorry, I can give you credit, but um, do any of the neighborhoods um, and these hubs apply for grants to support their ideas? Have you found that uh, grant applications are part of this process? Um, we have actually, and we've, we've seen that as a catalyst once we do the planning with this community. So I mean, one just pops to mind. Um, we did a few years ago, a community down by the coast. They went through this planning process with us and then realized that they were at this tsunami risk um, and wanted to build some steps to a hillside for their community. And so they, uh, after, after this planning process, the community got together and said, you know, hey, city council, will you give us some money to help build steps? And that, um, that happened. And, you know, this, it's a little actions like that, that hopefully someday um, will help save lives. So part of, you know, I guess part of it is when we go through this process, it's, it's raising the hazard awareness for people who didn't realize that there's a hazard um, to that degree in their local area. And then um, getting like-minded people together to problem solve in that instance, which is let's go find some money to build some steps so we have an evacuation route. You know, so it kind of cascades out, right? Awesome. And then I have a question from Braden. Um, he's asking, since you're from Arizona and you've been observing our work with Neighborhood Justice, what do you see as a potential for community resilience in Arizona? What should our next steps be in growing a culture of community resilience right here in Tempe? Yeah. Um, yeah, as an Arizonan, I've, I've been really impressed with what I've seen that you guys have been developing out of this project so far. Um, and I, I think it, it, it really reminds me of when we were starting off with our program, which is kind of just trying to feel our way through it um, and, and get some early wins on the board. I think probably the, the, the area I'd be excited to look at how do we cultivate is, is how do we cultivate more relationships um, at the local level? You know, I think in Arizona, we're probably a little bit more, um, not as connected as we could be in our communities. Some of our communities might not be as defined and we don't have um, those kind of streetwide community, communities of place connections that I see stronger in other cities in the United States and, and elsewhere around the world. And so I'm um, using this program as a catalyst and as a conversation starter to help people um, come together and build some relationships, I think is a great first start or continuation of what you've already done, actually. And, and Dan, thank you. That was, uh, I guess, I have a, a kind of a follow-up question to that about just maybe even diving deep into what you just mentioned about other practical ways that we can overcome the lack of social connection here in the Valley. Um, do you see any practical steps that uh, in your experience would help kind of, uh, in, in kind of connect those bridges, especially during you know, times of a pandemic and so on and so forth, but what are some other practical steps if you have any that come to mind? Um, I think street parties are a great, great model for that. Um, a shout out to Daniel Holmesy's work in San Francisco, uh, the Community Empowerment Network he, or Neighborhood Empowerment Network. He's, he, they do some great, the city funds um, street parties and they use those street parties as a catalyst for conversations around what to do in an earthquake, right? But it's actually about street parties. So I, I come back to that idea of like, the more fun we can make something, um, I think food is always a, is, is always a good draw card, um, the, the better. Right, and so piggyback on whatever you, topic you want by using a street party, and you know, this, and, and cities that can fund that at a hyper local level, that, that's like that's a great return on investment. Awesome. I just wanted to add to that, Dan. I, while you were uh, mentioning this idea, I remembered. Uh, city of Scottsdale has like a really good supply of equipment for block parties. So if anyone in the chat uh, lives in Scottsdale and is thinking about where they can contribute, I think that's a good place to start. It looks like they have ice chests and game tubs, water coolers and portable sound system. So just a little, just highlighting Scottsdale in there. So um, anyone wants to contribute can. And then back to you, Marcus. Thank you for the additional links, Ty. They're, they are appreciated. Uh, this question comes from Monica, and it says, I would like to see most libraries service community hubs. Any idea on how to move this forward at the national level? Uh, I guess, you know, help paint the, help tell the story of, of the value add of a library, not just every day, but how they're gathering places for people of all walks of life, that they're probably the 
one of the most valuable community resources that a city has, um, that they're usually well located. I mean, they just, they, 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 they fit um, the criteria in so many ways. Um, yeah, I, I think it's, it's telling that, it's just kind of thinking, thinking, framing that, um, what is a, you know, during an event, post-event use and framing that in some sort of way would be my first step I'd suggest. Uh, thank you, Dan. I think we, it's 108, we have about two minutes left. Um, let's see, there's a question here from uh, Haley in the chat. If a community member or group would like to propose implement projects, how does your team support them in going through the necessary processes to gain approval by the city, especially if within a city county jurisdiction? Uh, in their experience, it often takes a really long time for anything to get passed or community members to find the right person to talk to, which can decrease their motivation and empowerment to complete the project. Yeah, totally. Been same same story in New Zealand. Um, again, one I think my team perform a, just a wide range of responsibilities and functions, and a key responsibility they have is is connector, right? So they their job is to network and connect other people to other opportunities. And so we've got really good connections with our city council. So when we're approached with good ideas, our job is to help connect them to the people that do fund that at a city council level or other NGOs if we know about them. And again, kind of the role of social capital, right? Um, thank you, Dan. I think that that concludes our question and answer um, portion and I will hand it back over to Anne. Great. Thanks. Marcus and Ty, thank you so much. That was a, a great facilitation of questions. There, there are more, I think, that we could continue asking. Um, and so, Dan, I hope that you will come back and, and join us again. I just want to extend a heartfelt thank you to you as a presenter. Um, we really appreciate you sharing uh, your model, but also your experiences. Um, both, uh, you know, I, I think we've got a lot of opportunity here locally to apply what you have learned and implemented. So many, many thanks. Um